great to look out at my new home congregation. I just thank, thank the Lord. Would you bow with me in prayer? Almighty God, our gracious Father in heaven, we humble ourselves before you. And we seek your guidance, Father, as we study your word. And we seek your guidance, Lord, as, as we begin a new journey together in this community as your people, as um, a part of your kingdom. And we're seeking, Lord, to glorify you. And we pray that as we move from this point forward, that you will work mightily, work greatly through us all, that we may glorify you. Father, help us as we live our lives each day, as we leave this place and go out to our homes, to our community, and to our work. Help us, Lord, to do so in, in such a way that people will see your light shining through us and, and that through this congregation, uh, that a light will go out in this community and far beyond uh, that, that people will be able to see you. Lord, we simply seek to serve you. We submit ourselves to you. We humbly ask for your forgiveness for our sins. And we pray, Father, that you will help us live as a pure and holy and righteous people, not because of our own goodness, but because of your grace and your love and our love for you and our desire to serve you and to be as close to you as we possibly can be. Thank you, Lord, for allowing this time. Thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for helping me and my family uh, to find the place that uh, has, has received your blessing and a place that we can serve and glorify you. And thank you, Lord, for this church, for what they've already done, the many good works that they're involved in, and uh, the, the influence that they have had on this community. We just pray, Father, that <clears throat> as, as we work together, uh, we, just, we just ask you, Lord, to bless, bless our work, bless our efforts. Help us to grow spiritually. And help us, Father, to, to find those who are struggling, those who are lost, those who are hurting, and to reach out to them and bring them into the safety of your fold. And, and by that means, Lord, uh, to grow also numerically, that your borders, the borders of your kingdom, will spread in this community and, uh, and, and go beyond. Thank you, Lord, for your Bible, for your word as you revealed yourself to us, and help us as we uh, look to your word now and guide us in our study of it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. <clears throat> You are sure, uh, I'm sure you are familiar with this passage, <clears throat> excuse me, passage of scripture in Philippians chapter 4, and uh, especially verses 8 through 9, and that's where I'd like for us to spend our time as uh, we take a look at this epistle. You know, I love the book of Philippians for so many reasons. I, I love it for one thing because of its personal nature. There's, you can sense Paul's love for this congregation. And this is a congregation of God's people who have assisted Paul. He says, you've been partakers with me in the ministry. And, and you have, uh, you've been there with me. He said, he said at times when, uh, you know, others weren't there, you were there. And so he feels a very close relationship with this congregation. And then he goes to, uh, in, in the sense of, of this epistle, he writes a very special epistle. One of the things about Paul and about his writings, as you, as you look at his writings, you can see his relationship, for example, with Timothy, with Titus, and with others. Um, now, when he writes the church at Corinth, you know, he has, to, he has a very unpleasant task of dealing with some error, dealing, dealing with some issues. And so he comes across as the one who is, who is chastising, setting things straight, of course, the Holy Spirit writing through him. But when he writes to the uh, church at Philippi, it's a whole different mindset. It's a whole different tenure uh, to, uh, to, to what he is writing here. And uh, so if you would turn to Philippians chapter 4, and let's read. Excuse me. I'm trying to make sure I didn't mess up some of the papers I've got up here. Philippians chapter 4, and we're looking at verses... 8 9. 
Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Now, I'm reading from the New King James Version. The King James Version says to think on these things. And um, I mean, if you take a look at, at the Greek and, and you take a look at this word, I think the New King James Version uh, by, by saying meditate on these things really takes that to the, the sense that is in the Greek, that it's more than just simply thinking about it, but it is letting your mind dwell on it. And there's a huge difference there because thinking about something doesn't necessarily change you. Meditating on it has the, the prospect of changing you. And so it allows us to be changed and, and to dwell on these things as, um, as is the, the idea here in the word meditate. And then verse 9, the things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. You may remember a scene from Peter Pan. When um, the, the children are, are trying to learn to fly like Peter Pan. And he says, you know, fly away with me. Well, well how do you do that? And if you remember what Peter Pan told him, he said, you just think lovely, wonderful thoughts, and they lift you up in the air. What we expose ourselves to and what we dwell on in our mind begins to shape us. It has everything to do with our thought process and our character. And so here is a, here is a scriptural guidance to allow ourselves to be changed as we dwell on, as we meditate on these things. The NASB actually has the translation, dwell on these things. This is a matter of right thinking. This is a matter of training our mind. One of the, the, the ways maybe to test on, on how our, our, our mind works is our first reaction to things. And, and here's one where I really have to administer some self-discipline and, um, and try to think the best of people first. And, uh, you know, sometimes, as a matter of fact, have, have you ever gone to Walmart or maybe you've gone to a restaurant, you've gone to eat somewhere, and you see someone, they, they come in, and they're dressed a certain way, and, and, and maybe they have a certain demeanor about them, and you look at them, and you automatically, you automatically look at that person, and you see them through a certain template, and you say, that's the kind of person this is. All right. Now, that's, that, that kid's a punk, you know? Or, the, or this person over here, well, you can tell that that person's a deadbeat. You know, there's a lot more than meets the eye. And one of, the, uh, one of the phrases that I've heard, and I know that you've heard a number of times, that I often remind myself to think when I am tempted to think negative thoughts about someone that maybe I don't even know, is except for the grace of God, there go I. Or, or, or even, even someone who is the, the drunk on the side of the street. So many times, so many times, especially driving through Nashville, in certain areas of Nashville, and uh, you, you see someone who's uh, just, you know, sitting there in, on, on newspapers with a bottle in his hand, and I've trained myself to think because I haven't always thought this way. You know, I used to think, well, look at that deadbeat. Why doesn't he get a job? You know? And I've trained myself to think, except for the grace of God, there go I. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for allowing me to be raised in a different environment. Because the choices that I might have made or the things that might have affected my life might have put me right there. And you know what that does? That makes me then want to make a difference in that person's life. It, it, it makes me want to say, okay, so God has given me blessings. God has blessed me in a certain way. 
Now it's my responsibility as a steward of those blessings to change the circumstances of other people's lives, that they might have the same blessings that I have. And so this, this whole thought process begins to change us, beginning from inside, and it changes the way that we deal with people, and it changes the way that we work and the way that we live. So uh, let, let's, let's take a look at these. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true. Now, I want, I want your input here. Whatever things are true. What, what's your first impression? When you, when you hear that, what is your first impression? How would you, how would you, how does that strike you? You say, okay, I need to think on things that are true. How do I do that? I'm sorry? All right, study in the Bible. Okay, but what if it is true? Thank you. You're right. You're exactly right. Um, you know, so uh, somebody comes to you and they say, well, did you hear about so-and-so? You know, then, then I, have a, I have a choice to make. Have you, ever, have you ever walked into a room? And when you walk into the room, you can tell just by the way people are gathered around and by the tenor of the conversation, you can tell that people are gossiping about something. And, and so as you walk into the room, you start to hear this gossip. You realize how powerful you are in that situation? What, what can you do to completely change that conversation? That's, do you know that to be true? Is, are you sure? Where did you hear that? Is that but you know, you, know what, you know what's the quickest way you can turn that thing around? Say something good about the person that is being gossiped about. All you have to do is say one thing good, and everybody stops, typically. Okay, whoa. This person is this person's not adding to our conversation and slandering this person's character. This person says something good, we better back off. Now, as a matter of fact, I would say that is the most powerful thing that you can do to, to, to put, throw water on the damaging fires of gossip is to simply say one thing positive about the person being gossiped about, nobody then wants to continue that conversation. Typically. Uh, not necessarily always, but typically. I found it to be the case. If this person is not sympathizing with us in this, we better stop. We'll wait till this person leaves, carry on. And you know what? They may choose to, but you have taken a higher plane. You have risen above. Okay, so, so there in, in our dealings with each other, what about, um, some, you know, somebody suggested the, uh, the idea, the, the fact that we need to know the truth of God's word. And definitely, you know, Jesus in his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, verse 17, said, sanctify them through what? The truth. Thy word is truth. So truth sanctifies us. Now, you, you know what the word sanctify means? Can somebody tell me what the word sanctify means? Thank you, an educated people. Set aside for a special purpose. So, um, you know, you may be, maybe you have that, that uh, black iron cornbread skillet. You know, nothing makes cornbread like an iron skillet. And so that is your cornbread skillet. Maybe it's the only thing you do with it, but, but it has a special purpose. Well, in a sense, that's sanctified. Now, we think of sanctified as you'll be made holy. Sanctified simply means set apart for a special purpose. Now, we are sanctified because we are God's holy people. And so we are different. What makes us different? The truth of God's word. And you remember how that the, uh, the Israelites looked about them and they wanted a king. They said, hey, everybody else has a king. We want a king too. You remember what God said about that? When, you know, when, when Samuel was concerned about that? You remember what God said? They haven't rejected you, they've rejected me. They've rejected who I am because they want to be like everybody else. If we start to do that in the, in the Lord's church, that's what happens. If we stop being sanctified by the truth, and people, people look at us and they say, well, you're, you're a peculiar people. I say, thank you, because that's what God told us to be, right? <laughs> a peculiar people. And uh, what a compliment. You know, it, is a, it isn't an insult when people say, well, you folks are different. I certainly hope we're different. We better be different. 
What makes us different? It, it, it shouldn't be our traditions, right? Tradition, tradition can never be upheld as our standard. Now, we all like tradition. I like tradition. But it can't be our standard. What is our standard? Our creed. The only creed we have, the word of God. And so, you know, truth does so much to empower us. I, I'll tell you, when I, when I was, I was probably, I think, in seventh grade, I read a book. I don't remember the name of it. I don't remember who wrote it. I don't remember the storyline. I don't remember who the main character was. As a matter of fact, I remember absolutely nothing about that book except two words. For some reason, as I was reading that book, I came across these two words, and I believe it was an inscription either in a book or on a ring in, 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 in the book. I can't, for the life of me, I've tried, I can't remember anything about that book except for two words. And when I read those two words, it burned on my brain and it never left me. Truth conquers. Truth conquers. I don't care what situation you're in. Every time, truth conquers. If you're dealing with a, a family member, maybe who's, who's of, a, of a faith, of a denomination, and, and you want to know how to deal with that family member, truth conquers. Truth in love. Never compromise. Never compromise with truth. I'll tell you this. Stacy, when I met her, was a member of a denomination. And as we, you know, the first time, the first time we went out, it was, it was an accident, kind of, you know. Um, I was going out to walk my dog. I stopped by the office to get a paycheck. She worked in the office. I said, hey, I'm going to walk my dog. She said, I wish I could go. I said, I'll pick you up uh, 15 minutes after you get off. That was our first date. We get home, and something had happened on that first date. We found out we really liked each other. And I, I remember when uh, I was leaving, after I dropped her off, and I said, can we do this again? And she said, you're Church of Christ, aren't you? <laughs> I said, yes, I am. I'm a Christian. She said, you know it will never work. I said, then we can just be friends. Well, that's what came out of my mouth. My mind was saying, you don't know it, but, I <laughs> but that's going to change. <laughs> Something's going to change here. It took four years, four years of studying, crying, and praying. But I'm so thankful for the day that the Lord blessed us when I baptized her in Christ. And you know what she told me one time? She said, Michael... My daddy says, you just won't compromise. I said, Stacy, I love you. I will change everything about my life for you. I will change the way I look. I'll change the way I dress. I'll change where I live. There is nothing in this world that is mine that I wouldn't change for you. Everything. But the truth isn't mine, and I can't change it. Folks, Conviction wins over compromise every time. And obviously, we're not going to get through with this lesson if I don't move on. What is honest? Well, that kind of goes back to truth, doesn't it? Honesty. You know, the best way to deal with a problem is deal with it. You know, we have this tendency to sweep things under the rug and just kind of say, well, I don't want to deal with that because it's painful, because it hurts. The best thing to do is to be honest, lay everything out on the, on the table, and deal with it. Uh, an issue in the family, lay it out on the table, deal with it in love. An issue in the church, lay it out on the table, deal with it in love. Be honest with each other. You know, one of the things that, I'll go ahead and say this, because I always say this when I start a class. You don't know me yet. And I don't know you. I know some of you. I'm getting there. But in my philosophy in class is that if you have a question, a sincere question, it needs to be asked. And you be honest about it. And you don't worry about being judged. Because there should be no safer place to find the truth than right here with these people. And if we need to struggle with the Word of God a little bit to deal with your question, we'll do it. And, and, and we will seek an answer from God's Word. And we'll
we're going to be honest. In the Lord's church, we ought to have a, a safe atmosphere of security where we can be honest with each other. And you know what that means? That means that we can stop pretending like we're perfect because we're not. I'm not perfect and you're not perfect. You know it and I know it. So there's no need in pretending about it. As a matter of fact, we're told to bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ is that we love each other as Christ has loved us. And we bear each other's burdens and we help each other to get to heaven. And sometimes that means being honest with ourselves. And realizing that we need help and we need forgiveness. We stop on the hour in five minutes. Okay, good. I got more time than I thought. What is um, what is just? Justness. This is something that it seems like our culture has forgotten. Justice. And nobody likes to look in the rearview mirror and see blue lights, right? And you look down at the speedometer and you didn't realize it, but you were speeding. And you say, that's not right. I don't need this. But, but you know what? That is a part of justice. And um, so you hear on the news some horrible atrocity. Uh, a mother has, has killed her children. Or, or a man has kidnapped a child. And, and they find out maybe that that child is dead. And the whole nation cries out for justice. Do we? Do we really? Do we really love justice? You know, justice and that, those, that idea of being just is an idea that we must be consistent with. An idea that will guide us in our principles. And even in the Lord's church, we seek justness. God is just. And, and, and here's something that really helps us in our relationship with God if we could understand this concept of justice. You know, sometimes people say, well, I don't think God would send anybody to hell. And I agree with that statement. I don't believe God would send anybody to hell. But I do believe that the majority of people are going to make the choice to go there. You see, God... God has given us the route to heaven. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to what? Repentance. And so it is not God's desire to send people to hell. And it is not God's purpose to send people to hell, but God gives us the decision. God gives us a choice. And, and, and friend, if you or I leave this life and we spend an eternity in hell, it is not because God chose to send us there. It is because we chose to reject him. God is just and God is holy. And when we realize, when we realize the holy and just nature of God, it all makes sense. Because of God's holiness, he cannot dwell with sin. Back at chapter 1, verse 13. Thine eyes are too pure to behold any evil, and you cannot dwell with iniquity. That's God's nature. Now, because he is the perfection of holiness, he cannot dwell with iniquity. iniquity. And, and you and I were created innocent. We were created pure and holy, and at one time had that relationship with God, but at the, time, the point in time that we sinned, we separated ourselves from him, and there is no hope without him. God sacrificed Jesus because of his justness. Jesus chose to, to empty himself of heaven and come to this earth and live as a man and to be tempted and tried as we are to die on a cross because of justness. Because your sin and my sin must be punished. It must receive the recompense of our error. Or God is not just. And if God is not just, he is not God. That's why Jesus had to die on the cross. Uh, because God is also perfectly love. Now, how do you, how do you, how does love and justice and holiness meet? The cross. That's the answer. And, 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 and so Paul in Romans chapter 7, he says, he's talking about that struggle of the flesh and the spirit. And he says, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And I thank God through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's the answer. There's the answer to your frustration. 
There's the answer to that struggle that you and I engage every day, the spirit against the flesh. Paul, in my opinion, and, and, and this is just my opinion, and you, you can choose to disagree, but Paul, in my opinion, is the greatest man to have ever lived in the shadow of Jesus Christ. That's just how I think of him. I think of him as a spiritual giant, and, 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 and he, is, he is my role model second Jesus. And, uh, and I read Romans chapter 7, and I say, this man struggled. Now, why do you think the Holy Spirit had Paul reveal that? You and I need to know it. You and I need to know that God understands. God created you. He, he loves you. He wants you to succeed. He's not, he's not some old man in a flowing uh, robe with a long white beard with a lightning bolt in his hand waiting to zap the next person who sins. God is not willing that any should perish. He loves you. He wants you to succeed. But he's just. He's holy. And that perfect love that can only be met by the price that was paid for you and I at the cross. Now, we think on these things and we say, then I should be just. And, and that means I should be fair. I should treat people fairly, but I also should be willing to call sin, sin, and deal with it as such in my own life and in the life of others for my good and for their good, to help myself and others get to heaven. Jesus said himself in John chapter 5, verse 30, he said, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. And there, there's, our, there, there's our motto. I do not seek my own will, but the will of our Father who sent me. And that means that we must judge a righteous judgment. Oh, but, but, but don't you know that Jesus said, judge not that you be not judged. <laughs> and I love I love how people take that, um, well, I don't love it, actually, I, but, it, but it's interesting how people take that passage of Scripture and pull it out of its context, because if you go on to read, Jesus says, do not cast your pearls before swine, do not give that which is holy to the dogs, and, and that calls for judgment. You know what he's saying? He's saying, you judge righteous judgment, not your standard, but God's, and that's what is just. What is pure? You know, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Pure in heart. And, and, and that's our desire. You know, it's, it's, we live in a world that makes it hard for people to have a purity of heart. You cannot be pure accidentally. It's something that we have to work at every day. You know what we need? We need daily renewal in order to be pure. And, and, and so every morning we seek God. We say, Lord, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. I want to be pure. I want to be holy. I want to reflect you in my life. And, and sometimes I get in the way of that. I seek your forgiveness and I'm asking you to renew me for today I'm living today for you. And if we do that every day, guess what happens? That starts to transform us. And no longer are we just seeking purity, we become pure. Now, does that mean that we're not going to sin? Absolutely not. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 tells us that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all our unrighteousness. Now, there's a few things about that passage of Scripture that we need to understand. One is, is that that passage of Scripture teaches that there is a continual cleansing. We get that. That's what we usually get from that verse. There's the, 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 Greek, the Greek there, cleanses, is actually uh, it has the connotation of a continual action. It is a continual cleansing if we are walking in the light. But somebody says, well, then what is walking in the light? Does that mean I don't sin? Well, if it means I don't sin, then what need is there for cleansing? If there's no sin, there's no need for cleansing. It means I am striving for perfection. I am seeking purity. 
and I am getting as close to God as I possibly can. And when my humanity fails me, I will reach out to God and he will pick me up. I will seek his forgiveness and we'll go forward. When we understand that, then we, we become empowered with the joy of our salvation. Because we have this facade, this idea of the super Christian. And we've all got to be the super Christian. Well, if you've attained that status, please let me know, because I haven't gotten there yet. Yeah. I'm striving. And you and I are going to strive together. And you know what? It's okay to say, I'm struggling. You know, sometimes somebody come into my office or they'll call me on the phone, they need to come by their house, and they say, I need to talk because I'm struggling. I, I'm, I'm struggling with sin. And I say, I'm so glad to hear that. And people look at me like I'm crazy. But I just told you I'm struggling with sin. I said, yeah, the key word there is you're struggling. It means you haven't given up. That means you're fighting the fight. And if you keep doing that, you will win the victory. It's when you give up and you stop the struggle that you've lost. We're seeking holiness. We want to be, we want to be as pure and as holy because we love God as we can be. We don't want sin in our life because sin is a disgrace to God. Sin, sin is an abomination to God. It's filthy. It separates us from Him. We ought to hate sin. We ought to say, if, if there's something sinful in our life, you ought to say, I don't want that. I want to get, remove that cancer from me. Yeah. Never, ever excuse it. Never, ever accept it. But understand something. God who created you knows you better than you know yourself. He knows your humanity. You can't hide it from Him. Don't try. Go to Him to receive your strength. And never, ever, ever stop the struggle. Never stop the fight. And you will prevail. Yes. Let me rise. Let's get back to this. In this this postmodern age of relativism where the only sin is to judge somebody else's sin. Yeah, exactly right. And that makes it, that makes it harder for us to train our mind on these things and realize we, we can't think like the world. Yeah. Any other thoughts on that? Beyond, exactly. And that's, that's like the next level, isn't it? The next level to giving up is becoming content with it and actually enjoying a life of sin, that which will send us to hell. it is. Yeah. Right. You know, so how do we deal with that, that sin? Any sin? We love the sinner and we seek to save them from that which will destroy their soul. Any sin. If you love somebody, now, this is, this is going to strike home. I, I doubt there are any families in here that aren't affected by this. You have somebody who's unfaithful. You have somebody who, who uh, is, their, their soul is in danger. Maybe someone who, who is a, a member of the Lord's church. What do you do about it? If, if you see someone that you love standing in front of a semi-truck that's barreling down on them, do you stand there and watch them and say, I don't want to get involved? But yet... 
we will stand by and watch a family member headed to hell, knowing it, and not say a thing because we don't want to hurt any feelings. You know? And I know, I, I know that strikes close to home, but I'll tell you what, and I'm going to share something with you. Oh, go ahead. I don't want to steal my thunder for, for a future sermon, but along what you're saying, 1 Corinthians 13, I, 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 think, I think a lot of times we read 1 Corinthians 13, but say, well, that's a nice little poster, you know, you know, about love. You take a look at 1 Corinthians 13, and what it is about is the fact that love should motivate us. Love motivates us to save someone's soul, to deal with sin in our own life first, to deal with sin in their life, to do what is right, to keep the church pure and holy and to grow. Love should be our motivation for everything. And if love is not our motivation, then we need to take a close look at our heart. But when love is our motivation, folks, we are unstoppable. When, when we are fueled, when we are empowered by a love for God, an intense love for God, we are absolutely unstoppable. When we love souls enough to have pity on their plight, to realize that they are lost and going to a devil's hell, and they need the Lord, and we have the capacity to take the Lord to them and, and, and to show them the path of salvation, when we love them like that, we can't be stopped. Very quickly, what is holy, or, or what, is, what is pure, um, and then what is lovely, which is portrayed by a lovely character. Interestingly enough, this is the only time in the New Testament that the word lovely occurs. To think on the things that are lovely. Now it is found in the Old Testament in reference to a physical beauty, a physical sense. But this is talking about lovely in a spiritual sense, in a lovely character, developing a lovely character. That which is of good report. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 1. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. You know, this is given in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7, as a qualification for an elder, to have a good report. It's important, isn't it? God says, this is so important that I want to be sure that, 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 all, that the shepherds of, of my flock have a good report. That their influence is not tainted. And then um, virtue, which is moral excellence. Seeking moral excellence, and we've really talked about that. And then praise, that which is worthy of praise and the giving of praise. Now, I want to end on this thought. I believe in praise. I don't think a day ever goes by that I do not tell my sons, I love you, I am proud of you, way to go. I believe in praise. Every single time they do anything uh, that is right, regardless of how big it is, I want to praise them. I believe that that motivates us character. If we, if we praise each other, instead of seeking to criticize faults, praise that which is good, you start praising your husband, you start praising your wife, instead of picking out the faults and criticizing those, you start finding the things to praise, I'll tell you what happens. You know what happens. That, they say, well, I want more of that. <laughs> I want more of that praise. I want, to, I want to keep doing the good things. I want, to, I want to do this again. This is helping me. And when we criticize, all we do is we just, we just tear people down and we don't motivate them. But when we praise, that empowers. And so be generous. Just make it a habit. Let's, if you don't already, then we'll, we'll work on this together. Make it a habit to be generous with your praise. Somebody does a good job, let them know. Send them a card, phone call, text message, or just pat them on the back and say, good job. And that goes so far. And boy, we start doing that, we start, we start building energy. And uh, a very positive thing. If there be any praise, think on these things. So what that does, that, that, see, that, that begins to develop how I see people. I am dwelling on praiseworthy things. I'm not dwelling on negative things. I'm not dwelling on things to criticize. I'm dwelling on praiseworthy things. And so I start to see my husband, my wife, my son, my daughter, my brother, sister, my friend, the elder, whoever, in a different light. I say, thank you. When's the last time you told your elders thank you? Thank you. Be 
working out for us. Just a very, very, you know what? Yesterday, TSA, okay? You know, going to the airport, security, nobody likes that, you know? And so I went through security, and this officer gave me back my driver's license, my pass, uh, boarding pass. I said, thank you for keeping me safe. And he looked at me kind of funny. And I said, you probably don't hear thank you very much, do you? He said, no, I don't. Thank you. A simple thank you. Every day. Waitress, cashier, whoever you meet, you say thank you. I appreciate you. Police officer stops you for speeding. Thank you for keeping me safe. Yes, even after he writes you a ticket. And that's where people start to see a difference between us and the world. Thank you. And thank you for your comments, Jim.